Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, rather than watching a video on a historical uh, period or topic or something like that, I'm actually uh, going to be watching a review of um, a TV show uh, from the 90s. And I'll explain why. Um, I get asked a lot by people about uh, why did I become a history teacher, you know? And... Um, to, to make the long story short, I, I've loved history ever since I was a little kid, you know, especially come on maybe around junior high when you actually tar start taking like real history classes. I was, I, I loved it, you know, uh, no, you know, uh, and, and I probably wouldn't even, even then been able to explain why. And even today there's, there's, there's little things you just can't quite explain about why you, you love it. And if you're a, you know, history lover, sometimes it's hard to articulate that. And then once high school came around, you know, that kind of love of history still stuck around but then the idea of teaching it also settled in and and during high school i was you know confident i wanted to be a history teacher i you know had probably by the time i was about probably when i was about 16 or so and um part of part of my childhood you know is that as a 90s kid of course is watching all the great tv shows out there the great kids shows out there and there weren't a ton uh, but there were a couple like history themed kind of shows kind of directed at kids that that i loved um and were definitely influential into my my love of like history um and uh, one of those by far the, the the one that was probably the most influential to me that really sparked that in me was a game show um, it was called uh, where in the world is carmen san diego so there was a game show version and then there was like an animated version and or animated like cartoon of it and but i really liked the game show most because it was this competition and you're a kid you love you know competitions like that but it, it i learned a lot about geography and history those are my two favorite contents to learn and teach about but another one that i loved um, was this what this video covers uh, it's called it's another basically like a game show it's a competition show called legends of the hidden temple and it's it's very loosely connected to history the basic premise is you have these pairs of kids and they're on teams and they're kind of like little indiana jones explorer types and each each week there's a story about some like missing historical relic you know, it, even Carmen San Diego was kind of like that too. But like this one was like a, it was like a historical relic, and basically you need to find it, and you need to get it. So it was this series of physical competitions, you know, and that was those were big in the '90s. You had like Double Dare and Guts, um, which again, just kids kids love that stuff. The academic or the uh, athletic competitions and was by kids. But the cool part, you know, especially with the the history for this show was at the end. You went through this obstacle course kind of thing that was basically designed to be the the hidden temple, and deep in that hidden temple was the uh, artifact that you are supposed to find. And if you get that, then you know your team wins and you get a bunch of prizes. So it was kind of cool. But again, it was like living out like a like a uh, an Indiana Jones type, you know, life. But um, so so a few days ago, I saw in just my feed or whatever um, this video had just popped up. I think it's pretty new. Um, by a channel called Defunct TV, and I think they just kind of go over, from what I understand, um, go over uh, canceled shows and stuff, and, you know, it's definitely, I think, like a nostalgia thing. You see some show, and you're like, oh, I remember that, and of course, this this show was was awesome. And, yeah, it's for, they're reviewing the, hist uh, the history of the Legends of the Hidden Temple, and I thought this would be cool, maybe just for nostalgic purposes, and you can see a little bit about what I was into kind of in the 90s, and, you know, the little small things that lay little layers of you know, uh, some of the passions you have later in your life. And I'm sure without even thinking about it, things like this, like Carmen San Diego and Legends of the Hidden Temple laid a little bit of those seeds. But anyways, I thought uh, maybe you'd be interested in this. Um, that'd be awesome. So we'll go ahead and check this out. And I'm sure I'll have plenty to jump in and give my, you know, little nostalgic feelings about. So check this out. And in the video too, if this seems like something you would have liked as a kid or you would like now, you know, let's talk about it. All right, let's go ahead and start. Got the retro TV there. Very nice. Man, 90s music for 
shows and stuff. On April 22nd, awesome. 1993, the U.S. Congress announced its plans to increase the oversight nine years of the old. Federal Communications Commission, the regulator of television programming. Many legislators were concerned that the agency was not doing enough to curtail violence seen by children on network TV. A year prior, in 1992, the American Psychological Association had released a report estimating that a child would witness 100,000 acts of violence and 8,000 murders on television by the age of 10. Yeah, I remember this being a big deal in kind of the early 90s with just, it was this big content scare because what you started to see in the 90s was way more things like, like, like I guess, violent related things, more adult things that were getting to kid viewers. Um, the, one of the biggest ones that was happening, of course, though, was with video games. It was around this time that uh, like Mortal Kombat is one of, uh, was one of the most important games that ever came out because it was extremely violent for the time there in uh, kind of the early 90s. And that's what brought in the ESRB ratings. Um, just like, you know, you have uh, for movies, you have PG, PG-13, etc. And that was a big controversy. So like there was this big, definitely this, yeah, like they're saying this, this like public health issue, right? You see on the screen here for just media getting to kids there, right? And I remember that when that, like that, that kind of stuff was happening. Um, it was a big thing and it was going to Congress and they were debating it and trying to get laws passed and of all the stuff, trying to protect the children. So I very much remember this and the stuff, of course, we have today that, that kids are exposed to is miles more violent and adult than what was going on here in the 90s. But I guess maybe things are just scaled to the times that they are. And the, the same debates are happening today about, is this media, television, and video games causing the violent tendencies, you know, in, in kids like that? I remember this being a very real topic that people would talk about. Outcry from parents and citizens concerned about the consequences of such media. And many psychologists began speculating whether the children watching the violence would eventually replicate the behavior. This was bad news for the major American networks, but great news for Nickelodeon. Launching as Love Nickelodeon. in 77 before being given its recognizable name in 1979, Nickelodeon was the first cable channel dedicated to children's programming. The network struggled for the first years of its existence, but found its stride in the mid 80s by airing shows such as You Can't Do That on Television and producing the first Just a little bit before me. This Double was Dare. big. Nickelodeon increased its production output. Hopefully, hopefully they talk more about Double Dare. Double Dare was one of the first like game show type things for kids because it, it combined like like they would have like trivia parts was with your family and then you'd have these physical challenges and that was so cool and every kid wanted to be in those you know and in 1989 the network began producing the majority of its shows in a newly built studio within the soon to open universal studios florida park by 1993 nickelodeon was the most popular children's television network with game shows kind of the only one i knew of, of the were there others after concerns were raised over the amount of violence on television, more parents began to migrate their kids to Nickelodeon and other children's networks. So Nickelodeon completely cashed in on just the whole there's too much violence in media thing. And it, it was that was the golden age, I would think, of, of Nickelodeon was, um, yeah, the 90s, right? I, I know it's still big now, but um, kids are watch, watched more TV back then than they do now. Now today there's so many things that channels and or not even channels but just internet media so as far as golden age of kids television i don't think it beats the 90s and more advertisers were beginning to realize how lucrative a pool of highly suggestible grade schoolers was this perfect storm was a lot of money an era of children's programming and on september 11th 1993 nickelodeon would begin airing what would become the most memorable game show that they would produce. that's double dare but yes here it is that should I'll talk about that, that guy they called him Olmec. I don't know until I was much older that uh, Olmecs were a civilization, a pre-Columbian an ancient pre-Columbian civilization, but he was a talking head and he was he was super cool. I always thought he was he was like awesome. Like who's controlling him and stuff. I, I thought that was so cool. Legends of the Hidden Temple. Yeah. Legends of the Hidden Temple was described as a combination of Indiana Jones and Jeopardy. Yeah, and American it is. Gladiator's influence as well. The show was advertised as the first game show that lets kids live out legendary adventures. Selena Goober, why it was awesome. a children's marketing expert, predicted the show's success based off of the premise alone. This is so right. Okay, kids do love game shows. Kids are competitive. Like, all kids are, like, competitive. And that kind of wanes as you get older. But when you're in this, like, junior high age, let me late elementary... I mean, that's when kids would play, right? They'd get out and play and they'd compete and everybody was far more at like a similar athletic level. So it's like people had, 
you know, I think kids had had more of a chance of being able to compete. And as you get older and people phys- uh, physically matured in different ways, then you see some people not really liking the physical competition and, and, and those sort of things and sports and all that. But yeah, they love anything related to testing their own abilities. That That, that is totally true. That is totally true. And I love winning prizes. Even if it's not you, kids love watching other kids win prizes, right? Look at unboxing videos. People love that. It's like fulfilling to them to see somebody react to that i guess kids love game shows they love anything related to testing their own abilities they love to see kids winning prizes they love to see kids their own age interact with other kids and obviously sure. they love to have fun so if this show has all of the ingredients perfect it will be successful legends of the hidden temple was produced by stone stanley Productions. remember that the show was hosted by a then unknown actor named kirk fogg and a talking stone head named olmec voiced and puppeteered by d bradley baker a voice actor hmm. with a long resume of animated shows the game was separated doing, yeah. into four parts. Always wanted, to, always wanted to know who he was. Kirk Bog, the and Kirk Bog, the host. I never saw him again. I don't, never heard of him before. Never heard of him after. He was a great host though. But I wonder what ever happened to that guy. Teams of two competing for the grand prize. The team name stayed the same for each episode. These were the Red Jaguars, the Blue Barracudas, the Green Monkeys, the Silver Orange Snakes. Bonas, where are they? The purple Parrots and the Silver Snake. That was my team. And if you know anybody that watched this show, everybody had a team. And if they're telling you didn't, they're a liar. Everyone had a team. I don't know why, necessarily. I always loved the Silver Snake, so I always rooted for them. And then the, the chances that they won, that was so cool. I felt like it was like, it was like you know, when your sports team wins. You feel like you're almost like part of that. And yeah, I loved the Silver Snakes. If you watch this show, put in the comments, um, what did, uh, what, what, which uh, team did you like? Each team comprised of one boy and one girl between the ages of 11 and 15. After the intro, Olmec would introduce Kirk, who would then quickly explain the premise of the show before asking Olmec what today's legend was. Each show had a different story that would serve as yeah. the episode's title and theme. It would also be used throughout the different levels of gameplay. During the intro, Olmec would give the title of the tale to and come, a cheesy yeah. the name of a historical Opening. or fictional figure and an object of some kind. Some of these were classic tales, while others were a bit more obscure. The legend of the royal torque of Queen Boadicea. Yeah. Some stuff was so random. Like some some things you'd heard of and even now, but a lot of them you'd have no idea. And I think I, I'm trying to remember, and maybe if I look through all of them now, if they were actually real people or like real objects, I think a lot of it was made up. But when you were a kid, you're like, you had no idea. So I don't know. I, I would actually be interested to go back and see the stories and stuff that they, they did. Um, were they real objects or real people? So it's usually like, yeah, the the something of someone's, you know what I mean? Someone's something in, in history. So I have to look back and see if any of those were legit. Mystical spellbook of the Imperial Wizard. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's hear what this one is. Boadicea, the mystical spellbook of the Imperial Wizard. Your quest is to find the walking stick of Harriet Tubman and bring <laughs> yeah. it back. Like, was there actually a... a a famous, yeah, s- s- uh, walking stick of Harriet Tubman. So they tried to add in little educational levels, no, or uh, little, yeah, educational things, and that was that was cool. And I, since I liked history, and it was about this age when I really started understanding that, I always thought that was really cool. Here, the first challenge was the moat. Each team was tasked yep. with crossing a small pool by a specific means. This could require some people were so bad at it. Raft, crossing a bridge, or whatever else the production team could come up with. Some of them were hard looking. They typically have their own wrangler on the other side of the moat, making sure that they were navigating the challenge safely and fairly. This often resulted in the kids having to go back into the water to start over. Yeah, if you fell in, you had to start over. Oh, Silver Snake, come on! He was at the end! You blew it! press their button and ring their gong. The first four teams to do this successfully moved on to the next round, while the other two teams were eliminated and sent home with a consolation prize. I remember if Silver Snakes didn't make it, they were in one of the top four, it like ruined the day for me. I was like, all right, I'm out, you know, I'm not even watching, just be grumpy the whole time. (laughs) It seems so petty, of course. Didn't make it, but you're not going to go away empty handed. Here's what we've got for you. Get the hottest looks with LA looks for soft <laughs> That's the prize you got if you lost Control in the first gel. round. Hair gel Hershey or Hershey syrup. Today people are packing light, refreshing Starkiss tuna in pita salads and subs. Some, some blimpy. Oh, Starkiss. Charlie not in What a lame prize. You get some the tuna fish. The steps of knowledge. 
Here, Olmec would tell the episode's legend, with the kids listening carefully to the story. Once he was done, they would be no. quizzed over the information they were just given. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It was like a test. He goes through, Olmec goes through the story, tells you it. It was like like homework. It was like, you had to sit there and listen to the story. And then they quizzed you on if you basically if you were paying attention to the story. And <laughs> I forgot about this part, but... This is part if most kids weren't even paying attention. Like, like get to the competitions. But like me, like in history, I was like, oh, this is cool. What's this story, you know? So I think I would have been good at this part. The answers were multiple choice, and the teams rang in by pressing their foot on a stone on their step. They were not required to wait until all of the options were read, which could lead to some pretty awkward moments. Which of these people fought yeah. the Trojans in the Trojan War? The Romans? Silver snakes. Paris. Incorrect. What? Silver snakes. You didn't listen to the end of the question. And you said Paris. That's not a people. Okay, let's watch this fail one more time. I'm so sad that the, the bad example they used was my team. Roman silver snakes. Wait, uh, what was the question again? People fought the Trojans in the Trojan War. Who fought the Trojans? Roman the Greeks. Paris. Incorrect. If a team answered a question correctly, they would move down to the next step. If they didn't, oh. the other teams were given an opportunity to answer, and there was no punishment for guessing wrong. The first two teams to <laughs> well, answer the questions correctly moved on to the next round, while the other two were eliminated and awarded with slightly. Then you always felt these like were the dumb kids, like back there, like they didn't they didn't get a single question right. Like, how does that feel when you're back when you're back there? All right, Silver Snakes made this one though. I don't know if that that wasn't the same people though that. We're dumb on the first one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're not dumb. NBA Jam for Genesis. Oh. Game Gear is now here with 54 of our hottest NBA stars and incredible. Oh. Best sports game ever made. One of the best games of the entire 16-bit generation. Still probably the most fun sports game out there. NBA Jam. Man, this 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 is like my childhood. Legends of the Hidden Temple and Nickelodeon with NBA Jam. That pretty much sums me up, my childhood in uh, the last 30 seconds. I remember those things. Like, you can jump really high, and they, they're actually terrible, I'm sure. After a commercial break, Man. the show would come back to Kirk and the remaining two teams. Before the next round of challenges, Kirk would interview the four players, typically asking their name, age, and sometimes a fun fact about themselves. Yeah, what? This was the peak of the show's awkwardness. What's your favorite school and, uh, subject? I like to dance. Yes. Um, well, I take jazz, tap, and ballet. Oh, really? Would you like to tap for us right now? No, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> a pitcher. For, Do uh, it. Uh, what team? Dance. For the Yankees. Really? Not Ooh. the New York Yankees. No. Just kidding. No, okay, not yet. I sing in my school chorus, and I also went to Allstate Chorus this past spring. Right. And what do you like to sing? Madonna. In chorus. Nice. Yeah. All right. The team hey, hey. a series of three one-minute challenges hype. in which the teams would compete for the pendants of life. These were typically oh, yeah. a test of speed, agility, and or prepubescent upper like... body strength. They were all themed after the show's legend, and the type of challenge varied. The tough part about this game... Seems like you were Indiana Jones. Whoa, Going for historical relics. The first two games were each worth one half pendant, with the final game being worth one pendant. The team with the most pendants at the end of the three games moved on, hey, so while the snakes. other would be eliminated and rewarded a consolation prize. If the teams tied, both earning one full pendant, a final multiple choice question over the episode's legend would serve as a tiebreaker. You know, I always wondered, they never really showed it, but I never saw, like, a kid that lost, like, have a t tantrum. Like, freak out, have a tantrum. I wonder if that's happened in these shows and they just don't edit it, where someone loses and they just the kid loses it, right? Or since so it's partners, like, you know, going after their partner, like, gosh, you suck. How do you not know that? How did you mess that up? You know what I mean? Or just freaking out or fight the other team. And never, you never saw that. That wouldn't have been very good. But I wonder if that was ever a thing. Because, you know, kids, they get, they're easy to um, frustrate. After another commercial break, the team deemed worthy of entering the temple was introduced to the final round, the temple run. This was what everyone wanted. A difficult maze of rooms, filled with physical obstacles, puzzles, and traps. Before this final round would begin, Olmec would explain the various scary. parts of the maze to the kids in the simplest way possible. 
You could start by climbing through the ledges and climbing down into the pit of despair. Race into the I wanted to do this so bad. Unleash the power of the special white laser, and you could choose to go up to Medusa's lair or Medusa's lair. The Jester's court. Turn the wheel to lift the stone slab, then race into the throne room. Sit on the throne of the Pretender, and you could choose to go up into Reach the room into of the fallen hole, columns, find the key, or, or into the treacherous holes of Python. And into the mine shaft. If you escape, you might race. That's right, they had a bunch of different ones, didn't they? The temple gate. They rotated them or something. The choices are yours. This thing was hard, too. Not, I don't, I, I'm trying to remember. I, I feel like most kids didn't pass this. It was challenging. Um... And a lot of times the kids were confused, and I'm sure they'll talk about it here. But yeah, you go through all these different rooms, and uh, yeah, like things you've seen from movies, you know, Medusa's whatever, and then the royal throne, and um, these different like historical things. It was it was really cool. But this was the coolest thing. If you, it, it, this is the part of the show you wanted to watch, and the part that you wanted to do as a kid. But it was kind of scary too. I remember because well, they'll hopefully show some other things. But yeah, it was it was uh, kind of scary. And yours alone. The team decides which player will start the run. The first player to enter is given one full <laughs> pendant, and the second is given any of the remaining pendants one during okay, the yeah, yeah, yeah. These were used if, and more likely when, a player would encounter a temple guard, a grown adult dressed in costume and wearing a mask, hiding in bare. That was cheap. That was cheap. So it ran in random rooms. There was the temple guard. You have this like Maya looking temple guard, and he would come out. And I don't know how they decided where they're going to place it, if it was just random. And yeah, if you if he caught you, you had to give up one of your medallions that you earned during the game. So if you didn't have very many of these medallions, because you got medallions for winning them, it, it you were screwed. Because once you got caught without these, the game was over. Um, which was cheap, again, because it's total you know, RNG, right? You didn't know where this where these guys would be. Various rooms in the well, I thought that was cheap. Preparation for the child to arrive. There were three throughout the temple, and if a player encountered one, they would have to give up their pendant. If the player was caught a second time, they would be escorted out of the temple by the guard, and their teammate would begin their run. Ah, uh, the yeah, that was how it worked. Yeah, yeah. Zero, one half, or one full pendant, depending on their team's performance in the temple games. If they had one half, the second part would be hidden in the temple, and the player would need to find it on their way to the artifact mm. in case they encountered a guard, as only a full pendant would allow them to continue. Okay, in yeah. In a scenario where the second player was caught with zero or one half pendant, the team would lose and the game would end. The guards terrified some kids, and many cried after encountering them. Yeah! That was scary! That was so scary, even as a viewer. The team only had three minutes to find the artifact and make it out through the temple gates. Each room had a fairly simple task necessary to open the door, but to make it even more difficult, some of the doors were permanently locked, causing some paths through the temple to result in dead ends. During the show's yeah, run, cheap there were 15 <laughs> different temple layouts and nearly 50 different rooms. Oh, Examples wow. of these rooms were the observatory, in which the player would turn a sundial in order to open a door, the wall climb, in which the player would have to use ropes to climb a wall and hit a button to open a door, the mine shaft, where players could take an elevator up, break through a rock wall, or find a button and the infamous Shrine of the Silver Monkey. This room made its way into every temple layout, and despite the puzzle only being three pieces and never- They always screwed it up. Shows run, the kids had an incredibly difficult time putting it together. Yes! Yeah, the three pieces. The kids were so bad at this. Now he's got the head, he's got okay, he got off, it. But he's get the base on. Kids could never get it right. They didn't know like how to align it. It was just three pieces. After grabbing the artifact, all of the doors to the temple unlocked and the guards disappeared. Oh, that was the only thing thrilling. Left for the contestant to do was run out of the temple as fast as they could in an attempt to beat the clock. If they were successful, they won the grand prize, oh, which included imagine. a few small prizes and a vacation. If they were unsuccessful, yeah. they won a lesser but decent prize. You're not gonna go away empty this is where I wonder if there's be kid to be like, gosh, freaking stupid game, stupid Nickelodeon Legends of the Stupid, or look at the other partner and be like, gosh, you sucked. But they were all pretty good sports, for the at least what I saw. Microscopes, go. they said. So they're like, yay. We individually inspect every <laughs> single diamond that comes in that building. All right, and let's we continue on here with the after in. the ad. Like the majority of the other shows on the channel at the time, the show was shot at Nickelodeon Studios and Universal. Always wanted to go there as a kid. Didn't, the kids were chosen. Didn't get. Didn't go to Universal Studios till I was. Uh, 
in college, pretty much Universal Studios, Florida there. But man, that would have been so amazing to go to if I was a little kid and go, go there like this, like a want ad, go and get on the show. That would have been like my dream as a kid. Then through auditions, most coming from in and around Orlando, Florida, the children were put through physical tests, history tests, and interviews. The contestants were supposed to be between the ages of 11 and 14, but some that auditioned as 14-year-olds were 15 by the time of filming. Cheaters. After being selected and giving a filming date, the children would arrive to the Universal Studios backlot. The kids were separated from their parents, both taken to their own waiting rooms. The parents would remain in this room equipped with monitors so that they could watch their child compete, but removed from the main studio space as to not influence or distract their contestant. That's the kids a good were idea. given their team t-shirt and a pair of sneakers, both of which they would keep at the end of the day. <laughs> the waiting room for the contestants was filled with video games and toys oh, to keep the kids occupied, cool. as there was typically four or five episodes shot simultaneously. Oh, yeah, each that's episode's right. teams would complete All day. each challenge before the crew would move on to the next round and set piece. For example, if a contestant were in the first episode to be shot on the day of filming, they would first cross the moat, then return to the holding room and wait for the other four episodes to shoot their moat scene. They would then return to the studio mm. and shoot the steps of knowledge, and then go back to the holding room to wait for the other four episodes to shoot their steps of knowledge, and so on and so on. Serving the audience, you saw all the one shows. Or two hours between rounds for each group, which is why the contestants appeared to dry instantly between the moat and the steps of knowledge. <laughs> the first day of filming for season Never one was done with little preparation, resulting in a 12-hour shoot. The moat section was typically edited down to a few minutes in post, but it often took between 5 and 10 minutes to shoot, and on very rare occasions, it took the kids half an hour to fully cross. The moat was also filled with really? warm water and not very deep. Olmec's story relating to the artifact would be told to the contestants backstage prior to the shooting of the Steps of Knowledge. Okay. This was to increase their chances of answering the questions correctly. The team so that's ridiculous if you didn't know it. Given a tour of the temple run, with explanations of each room and the ways in which to unlock it. The temple run was made purposefully difficult, and only 26.7% of teams that attempted it succeeded. That's what I thought. I did not think it would be half of that. So the kids did... Okay, I didn't know if the kids ever knew the temple, the, the, out, the layout specifically um and that that makes it stranger that so many kids got lost and so many kids couldn't figure out like how to do the games and stuff like that obviously it's hard when you're you know live or you know on tv and you're being recorded and you did and you're young right so you get a little bit of stage fright there but um interesting this was supposedly due to the limited amount of grand prizes that the studio and sponsors were willing to give out Thanks to highly detailed fan sites, many statistics about the teams and their performances have been calculated. Oh, wait. Notable findings are that the Orange Iguanas were the team that made it to the Temple Run the most, appearing 25 Ooh. times out of the show's 120 episodes. The Purple Parrots appeared the least, <laughs> only making it to the Temple 11 times. Huh. The team also had the least amount of successful Temple Runs, oh. only completing three during the entirety of the show. Sorry if you, uh, were, the per if you were the Purple Parrot fan. I don't know how many people were. I never heard of people really being a Purple Parrot fan, but... Maybe now you can see why they, they sucked. While the orange iguanas made it to the temple run the most, they were the second worst at completing it, only making it through Bad with the percentage. artifact four of the 25 Who was the attempts. best? The green monkeys and the silver snakes were tied for the most successful temple runs, both having completed the course eight times. The first season of the show was shot... Okay, do they still sell those shirts? I need a, I need a, a silver snake shirt. Someone let me know if that's if that's a thing in around 10 days, with a total of 40 episodes being produced. One or more episodes would air per week throughout the remainder of 1993 and until May of 1994. A second season was quickly ordered and produced while season one was airing, and the first episode of season two would premiere just days after the final episode of season one. Likewise, season three would begin airing days after the end of season two. As there were many different versions of the temple run, the more significant changes, such as entire rooms being swapped out, would occur between seasons. Okay. Also, slight format changes would occur from season to season, such as what would be introduced by Kirk and what would be introduced by Olmec. The third season would be the show's last, with the final episode airing on June 27th, 1995. Mm -hmm. Legends of the Hidden Temple was a ended. hugely popular show, and many were surprised by its cancellation. Or more accurately, its non-renewal. The show produced a total of 120 episodes, so Nickelodeon had plenty of material to air. The non-renewal was reportedly due to indifference from executives, and the channel's standard practice at the time of only producing shows for a few seasons, regardless mm. of their popularity. Did Legends would continue to air in reruns on Nickelodeon until early 1999, yeah. when it would move to Nickelodeon's new sister channel, Nick Gas, short for Nickelodeon Games and Sports for Kids. 
Legends, along with other Nickelodeon game shows, would air exclusively on this channel until it shut down on December 31st, 2007. However, since the channel had been fully automated in its later years, a glitch caused Dish Network subscribers to be able to view the channel and its programming until April 23rd, 2009. Legends would also air during Nickelodeon's Nick at Night programming block, oh, cool. typically early in the morning. That. The show disappeared from television after 2009, but quickly reappeared in October of 2011, with reruns of Legends of the Hidden Temple airing on Nickelodeon's sister network, Teen Nick, as part of its The 90s Are All That throwback programming block. Well, I don't I don't think, like, a game, game show like that, I don't think that ages poorly, though. I mean, if kids are liking it, I don't think it will matter that it's that old. I mean, some shows can definitely get dated based on the content, but this is like like a like a game show like that. That doesn't that doesn't really age. So it's not surprising to me that they kept kind of bringing it back and doing um, reruns and stuff like that. Because yeah, I don't think that ages ages poorly. Reruns continue to air irregularly on the channel. Over 20 years after it was canceled, a television film based on Legends of the Hidden Temple was produced for Nickelodeon. What? Using the same name as the show, the film told the story of three kids Never heard of this. into a hidden temple theme park, eventually getting trapped inside a real temple and swept into an adventure. Both Kirk Fogg and <coughs> Bradley Excuse Baker me. returned, with Fogg playing a fictional version of himself oh. and Baker reprising Olmec. The film has many references to its game show source material, such as the Steps of Knowledge, Temple Guards, The Pendants of Life, okay, I need to see The Shrine this. of the Silver Monkey, the team names appearing in many forms, and much more. The film premiered on Nickelodeon on November 26, 2016. Legends of the Hidden Temple. I need to see that. I've never heard of that. It was a game show played by kids, watched can by I see kids, it? and appeared as though it was created by kids. The Indiana Jones-esque theming, large set pieces, and complicated obstacles felt like something a child would imagine, which was exactly the kind of content that Nickelodeon was hoping to produce. Thanks to the show's elaborate theming and deep lore, Legends had the biggest fan base of any game show on the channel, and the community is still alive and well. While it is hard to say goodbye to a beloved show, let alone an entire era of television, it can't be as difficult as the Shrine of the Silver <laughs> Monkey. Come on, no, just it goes on. Well, that was fantastic. So much nostalgia there, and and uh, appreciate you if you stayed with the video here. If you were if you're a little younger than me, then um, if you had never heard of this, hopefully it seemed like something um, that you would have been into. I mean, maybe you would have been into if if you had never heard of the show. Um, Um, if you haven't heard of this show, I don't know, does that seem like something you would have liked? Um, I loved it, and every kid I knew liked it, even kids that didn't like, you know, physical competitions. Like, everybody thought that was cool, and again, everybody had, like, a um, a thing, you know, a pers uh, a team that they liked. And um, it's it's amazing. I, I thought it aired longer than that, so basically it only aired for about two, three years um, but they produced a ton of shows. You can see, yeah, they, I, I don't know till, I, I think I'd only recently learned that they were filming a bunch of episodes in one day, which kind of makes sense just to, um, get it all done right there and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, this was, you know, a, a minor part probably, uh, you know, in my, in, in my youth of laying some of the foundations for thinking history is cool. Cause that this made history look cool. Although you I would never, probably at the end of the episode, ever been able to tell you what the actual story was about, you know, that they were trying to go for. I probably never yeah, been able to do that. But um, maybe subconsciously that, that kind of helps in a way. So, But anyways, this was, yeah, basically my childhood right there in a TV show and with the ads and stuff. That was that was great. So, I don't know. I hope you enjoyed that. It was a little something different here. Um, give me your thoughts. If you watched the show and you were younger, tell me what you think about it and what you thought of it and... That sort of thing. Again, if you haven't seen it, then I don't know. What do you think of this this type of show? Is it something you you think you'd be interested or would have been interested as a kid? All right. With that, um, I'll leave a link to the original video down below so you can go and uh, check that out. Give them a like and subscribe. Um, you can th uh, go through their channel. They have a bunch of old uh, TV shows that um, maybe you liked as a kid and they, they kind of review. It's kind of fun for nostalgic purposes there. So I think at least loosely kind of connects to my channel as kind of a history channel and Again, another part of just my childhood and eventually 
you know, become a, uh, so passionate about history. So that was cool. All right. Um, a few ways you can support the channel. Thank you, um, for being here first and foremost, just for watching, but, uh, appreciate any subs. If you'd like to continue on as with, uh, with me as I try to find the best, you know, best out there on YouTube for the internet. Yeah. I'd love to have you as a subscriber. Other ways you can support the channel. Um, if there's a Patreon account, uh, one of the benefits of that is if you join the Patreon, you're ac give access to a weekly poll for one of the videos I watch, um, each week. So you join that, and of all pledge levels, they get to participate in that. Also, if you haven't joined our Discord server, um, there will be a link down below if you'd like to be part of another uh, active history community um, right there. Um, you are uh, very welcome to. and love to see you over there as well. All right, with that, thank you for watching today. I think we'll go ahead and cut it here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.